Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Nealon. Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to to speak at this conference. I'm going to speak about cardiovascular disease among survivors of breast cancer. This is my lecture structure. I'm going to talk initially about radiation therapy and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Then I'm going to talk about radiation therapy and heart failure. I'm going to delve briefly into traditional chemotherapy and heart failure, talk about some elements of targeted therapy, specifically as it relates to breast cancer and HER2. And lastly, I'm going to talk about the pipeline, the present and the future of cancer care. I'm going to start with this critical issue. The exercise tolerance, which is measured in many ways, but in this study in VO2 max of a 45-year-old woman treated for breast cancer, is the exact same as the exercise tolerance as that of a sedentary 75-year-old female. There are multiple reasons for why this is. The presence of cancer is a pro-inflammatory and can decrease exercise tolerance. Most going through cancer therapy is most people feel fatigued and weak and uh, can lead to exercise intolerance, or is it in part related to some of the therapies for cancer? First, I'm going to talk about radiation therapy and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I'm going to speak about a consult that I re relatively recently received because it helps frame the conversation. MG is a 63-year-old female, uh, stage 2 left-sided breast cancer, 2011, ER positive, HER2 negative. She had a lumpectomy. She had four cycles of dose-dense AC, which contra contains an anthracycline. She also had radiation therapy, and her primary care physician noted shortness of breath of recent onset. She had a pre-chemotherapy echocardiogram where her ejection fraction was 63%. Her current echo uh, showed a normal size LD with a new septal wall motion of the mouth and an ejection fraction which was reported at 53%. Her EKG that I, when I saw her in clinic did not have a bundle branch block. Her blood pressure was relatively normal, and her LDL was 119. It is clear that radiation therapy to the heart is associated with an increase in congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, pericardial disease, and valvular disease. The onset of any of these uh, morbidities, typically about 10 to 20 years after treatment with radiation therapy. It is also clear that there's a strong association between the dose of radiation therapy to the heart and coronary events, as shown in this seminal study from a New England Journal back in 2013, um, where there was a relatively linear correlation between the mean radiation dose of the heart in grays and the percent increase in major adverse cardiovascular events. Just for reference, for left-sided breast cancer, uh, many women will receive a dose of radiation therapy somewhere in this range, between four and six grades. It is also clear that the presence of traditional cardiovascular risk factors increases the chances of having a coronary event after radiation therapy. As an aside, uh, the, it's important to also realize that there's a difference in the way coronary disease presents in people who get radiation therapy for lymphoma and people who get radiation therapy for coronary disease. In patients who get radiation therapy for lymphoma, i.e. mediastinal lymph, uh, uh, lymphoma, typically they get osteocoronary diseases affecting the osteum of the right coronary artery and the osteum uh, of the left coronary artery here shown in the left main. But for women who get radiation therapy for breast cancer, usually it's just the anterior wall of the chest that gets irradiated and the anterior wall of the left ventricle that gets irradiated. So the most common site for coronary disease is here in the proximal to mid left anterior descending artery. Because of the recognition of the association between radiation therapy and cardiovascular disease, there are very many complicated algorithms which have been published. And in essence, what it boils down to, it's relatively easy if the patient is symptomatic, they get a cardiac assessment. But what do you do in the bottom here 
if the patient is asymptomatic. Well, guidelines suggest that they should have a screening echocardiogram five years after exposure in high risk and 10 years after exposure in others. High risk in general would be people who get more radiation exposure. And the functional non-invasive stress testing at five to 10 years uh, in everybody. Now I have, uh, as I'll discuss in the next couple of slides, I don't actually agree with the, in general, I don't agree with the use of functional non-invasive stress testing for the ident identification of coronary disease in women post-radiation therapy. And even though my first slide will slightly contradict why. There's one study, it's a prospective study of 114 subjects with left-sided breast cancer who had pre and post SPECT. They had a SPECT done at baseline, six months, 12 months, 18 months, and 24 months. And in that study, relatively remarkably, what the authors reported was that six months after radiation therapy, 27% of women with left-sided breast cancer had new perfusion defects. At 24 months after radiation therapy, 42% of women who had got treated with standard radiation therapy uh, had a uh, new perfusion defect on SPECT imaging. That means, that suggests that 42% of women uh, the, uh, after radiation therapy had developed uh, coronary flow obstruction. There are other ways to look at the coronary arteries. Cardiac CT is a little less uh, well established compared to SPECT in the assessment of uh, coronary artery disease after radiation therapy. But the advantages of cardiac CT is there's lower radiation exposure and you can visualize calcification, you can determine a calcium score and you can detect high risk plaque. And groups have applied cardiac CT to the detection of coronary disease in, in lymphoma. Not so much yet in breast cancer, but certainly in, in lymphoma. In this study of 179 patients treated with radiation therapy for Hodgkin's disease, Typically, these patients would unfortunately be young, and the study was done about nine years after, so the average age of the patient was 29 years of age. And so in a cohort who are 29 years of age, using cardiac CT, about 20% had coronary atherosclerosis of 10 years, which is pretty remarkable. You wouldn't expect a cohort at age 29, you wouldn't expect uh, coronary atherosclerosis by CT in hardly anybody. So in the patient that I described initially, we did a cardiac CT and we found that she had a non-obstructive plaque around 40 to 50% in her left anterior descending artery as shown with this arrow. And she also had several high risk plaque features which included positive remodeling and low Hounsfield units. Uh, the, uh, these high risk plaque features are additive beyond just quantification of, of uh, obstructive coronary disease. So despite an ASCVD score of 4.1%, we actually put her on high-dose statin therapy. The next I'm going to talk about is radiation therapy and heart failure. And I'm going to start with this. Radiation, rates of incident heart failure are eight times higher than matched controls after conventional photon radiation therapy for breast cancer. Seminal work from a group in the in uh, Amstead County in the Mayo Clinic has shown that there's a relatively linear association between the increased dose seen by the heart of uh, radiation and the development of clinical heart failure. And these are all using modern techniques. This is not historic. This is relatively recent data. These are relatively recent data. The mechanism for the increase in heart failure among women who get radiation therapy for breast cancer is thought to be felt to due to increase in myocardial fibrosis. This is a small study, it's preliminary data unpublished, showing an increase in fibrosis from, from baseline. And then in between, they get, typically get anthracyclines. So that's the AC, pre-radiation therapy. And then post-radiation therapy, there's a, sub, a subsequent further increase in, radiation, in myocardial fibrosis. And this increase in myocardial fibrosis seems to be greater for those with left-sided breast cancer so if you've left-sided breast cancer and the heart is generally in the left-sided field, it's likely that the heart gets more RT exposure. So it's greater for those with left-sided breast cancer shown in red here than those with right-sided breast cancer shown in blue. 
So if there's a relatively reasonable correlation between the amount of radiation exposure that the heart sees and the development of heart failure in the setting of breast cancer, then it's reasonable to ask the following question. Can proton therapy be beneficial? For those in the, in the audience, as you're aware, there are two types of radiation therapy. There's conventional photon therapy for breast cancer, and there's proton therapy. Proton therapy is far less widely available than photon therapy. There are only approximately 30 centers in the U.S. where you can get protons for, bre uh, for breast cancer. But importantly, proton therapy delivers a tenfold lower dose of radiation to the heart and to the lungs than conventional photon therapy because you can direct proton therapy, whereas it's a, there's a lot of scatter with photon therapy. So are there any data to support this assertion that proton therapy might be safer from a cardiac perspective than traditional photon therapy? Global longitudinal strain is a measure of, of subclinical myocardial dysfunction. It's widely established in, in the assessment of patients at risk of chemotherapy-induced cardiac dysfunction. And in this prospective study of 40 women who, who, developed, who were treated with conventional photon radiation therapy, there was a reduction in global longitudinal strain in over 40%. We've done a pilot study, this is unpublished, it's currently in review, where we took uh, 31 women and we did serial measurement of global longitudinal strain pre and post proton therapy. So 31 women with breast cancer undergoing proton therapy and we found no change in global longitudinal strain. So in contrast to the prior study where they found a reduction in global longitudinal strain, we did not see any with proton therapy. And also we measured other things like ejection fraction, there was no change, and also looked at high sensitivity troponin and anti-pro BMP. And again, did not see an increase in high sensitivity troponin or anti-pro BMP with uh, proton therapy. This is leading us to do the following study where, because we hypothesized that proton therapy, there's less cardiac radiation exposure, therefore there's likely to be uh, less effects long-term on the heart, that we're going to do a randomized clinical trial whereby we randomize 80 women to proton therapy or photon therapy and follow their cardiac function using CPET to measure cardiopulmonary uh, capacity, uh, global longitudinal strain, and also measure myocardial fibrosis on, uh, uh, on MRI. I'm now going to talk about traditional cytotoxics for breast cancer. And again, I'm going to put this in the context of a recent consult, 62-year-old uh, woman, a little overweight. She was being scheduled for anthracyclines and the, um, for breast cancer. She had no cardiovascular symptoms. Her baseline ejection fraction was 55%. Blood pressure was a little bit high, and I was asked to see for suitability for planned chemotherapy. This was a little unusual in that uh, the um, typically don't get asked to see relatively asymptomatic people prior to radiation therapy. But in this case, I was because the patient herself was a nurse and asked to be seen by cardiology beforehand. As the, this group knows that anthracyclines are associated with developing the clinical heart failure. Here shown in the MRI image on the left, there's relatively normal left ventricular ejection fraction. And on the right is the uh, markedly impaired ejection fraction of a 40-year-old female treated with anthracyclines two years prior for breast cancer. The, uh, it's well recognized, as highlighted here, that the use of cardiotoxins such as anthracyclines are stage A heart failure. But I actually think they should probably be considered stage B, and, uh, the, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why. Just as background, as everyone know, in this room knows that anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity has a broad definition, but in general, anthracyclines are used in about 1 million patients worldwide. Uh, the, um, the data vary on how many develop cardiotoxicity. Some data suggest 9%. Some data suggest up to 25%. Uh, the, um, it all depends on definitions and the, and the cohort being studied and how aggressively you follow these individuals. It's also clear that the risk of heart failure is dramatically higher in those who receive anthracyclines. And there is an FDA-approved agent called Zinicard, which is not wide, to protect the heart, but it's not widely used because it concerns about uh, whether it actually protects the tumor at the same time. 
There's a common misconception that the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction decline post-anthracyclines is late. That may be the case for pediatric populations. It is not the case generally for adult populations. The vast majority of the declines in ejection fraction, which occur with anthracyclines, occur within the first year. 98% of cases will have a decline in ejection fraction within the first, uh, of those who do have a decline, will have them within the first year. This was shown in a seminal study from Dr. Cardinale out of Italy, where she looked, she serially, me she serially measured ejection fraction in two and a half thousand women. If you do endomyocardial biopsy on patients who get um, patients who are treated with anthracyclines, you will see cardiac injury in as low as 45 milligrams per meter squared. Just for context, in a single, uh, typically women with breast cancer get four cycles of, what they, of what's called dose-dense AC. Uh, the, um, that dose-dense AC, each cycle contains 60 milligrams per meter squared. So if you biopsy the heart of a woman who's received just as little as one cycle, and do electron microscopy, you will see evidence of cardiac injury. And generally, uh, the, there's a, in the early stages especially, there's relatively little correlation between that biopsy evidence of injury and the ejection fraction. So what to do with the, the, the nurse who, who came to see me in consult? Well, you can adopt the detective approach, which is a little complex. I've shown this algorithm here on the left, whereby you serially measure troponins or global longitudinal strain or ejection fraction or, and, uh, the, and you assess for injury. Or you can adopt the relatively non-detective approach, which is shown on the right, whereas they, if they have pre-existing hypertension, I switch to an ACE or an ARB. If they have high blood pressure, they start an ACE or an ARB. If they're at high risk and have a blood pressure of greater than 130 on 80, then, then we use an ACE or an ARB. If they have room, then add carvedilol or spironolactone. And if they have an indication, then we start the statin. Now, are there evidence for this non-detective approach whereby you just treat them all as if they're at risk of cardiac injury? There are some. Uh, Overcome trial is a study mostly in lymphoma. Prada was a trial uh, among women with breast cancer. In Prada, they used candazartan and metoprolol. In Overcome, they use enalapril and carvedilol. And with the enalapril arm and the candazartan arm, they showed pre preservation and ejection fraction. There are data, there are conflicting data about the use of beta blockade, beta blockade in the, for primary prevention among women getting anthracyclines. Uh, CC trial was broadly negative. Uh, the, um, the Overcome trial was suggestive, whereas the product trial was broadly negative about the use of beta blockade. Uh, so the studies would suggest some protective effect in using of AIDS or an ARB. The studies in using beta blockade, there are conflicting data. There are also some evidence that statins might be protective in this setting. There's a, a very nice study from the group in um, Cleveland Clinic from 2013, retrospectively, where they showed that statins among w women primarily with breast cancer were associated with a 60% reduction in heart failure um, after anthracyclines. And here and in um, other sites, we're doing a randomized trial looking at the uh, cardioprotective effect of statins in the setting, a uh, prospective randomized trial in the, in, in the setting of anthracyclines. The Europeans have guidelines on this, uh, on women who are about to get uh, anthracyclines, and they say you should consider cardioprotection in high-risk patients receiving anthracyclines for present, uh, prevention of LV dysfunction and to give it a class 2A recommendation. There are currently no guidelines in the U.S. population. Next, I'm going to talk about HER2. I'm only going to briefly talk about HER2 and cardiac dysfunction, even though it's an extremely common um, uh, common consult I receive. Uh, this is, was one of such consults. It's a 54-year-old woman who was stage 3B left-sided breast cancer, HER2 positive, got treated with anthracyclines, and as everyone knows, she was because she is HER2 positive, uh, she she is eligible for at a minimum Herceptin, and in some women, depending on cancer stage and a few other things, they get a combination of. Herceptin and Pergeta, and Pergeta is a monoclonal, they're both monoclonal antibodies against HER2. It's recommended when you're getting these medications that you actually get serial evaluation of left ventricular ejection fraction for not very good reasons. It's recommended, but it is recommended. It is actually a packet in the, it's in the package insert. So she was feeling fine, but getting serial assessments of left ventricular ejection fraction, 
and her EF dropped from 68 to 62 to 49 percent. She felt fine. In the package insert, if your ejection fraction drops by this level, even if you're asymptomatic, it is recommended that you stop the HER2 therapy. So the data based, the, the data suggesting that you should stop HER2, you should stop HER2 therapy is, a lot of it is, is quite historical. In the original study, uh, Dr. Slayman reported in the New England Journal on the use of Herceptin in women with breast cancer and reported uh, that 28% of women had a decline in the ejection fraction in the combination. The combination obviously improved cancer outcomes and was approved, but they said because of this high rate of cardiac dysfunction of 28% that these women had to be monitored. Uh, the, um, the thing is in that original study, Herceptin and anthracyclines were given together, and that's actually not what happens in currently in clinical practice. In clinical practice, women get anthracyclines, they get a rest, for several weeks, they get a reassessment of cardiac function, and then they start Herceptin, which is given over a year. So in current practice, treatments are separated, whereas in that original study showing all the LV dysfunction, uh, the, um, uh, they were given uh, concomitantly. There's a key difference between the cardiac dysfunction seen in the setting of drugs like Herceptin and the cardiac dysfunction that's seen in, in the setting of anthracyclines or doxorubicin. And the key difference is with Herceptin, there's no evidence of permanent cardiac injury. With doxorubicin or anthracyclines, there's evidence of permanent cardiac injury. And so if you stop Herceptin, the LV ejection fraction will actually get better. Whereas if someone develops cardiac injury in the setting of doxorubicin, the cardiac, the, depending on the timing, uh, the, it'll improve in a reasonable percentage, stay the same in about a third and decline in a third. So it's very different, the mechanism of injury. When you give Herceptin, the EF declines, the heart is in hibernation. You can measure serial troponins, you can do biopsies. Troponins are normal and the biopsies are unremarkable. You stop the Herceptin and the EF automatically uh, improves itself. In the setting of doxorubicin, that's not the case. So in this woman who came to me with uh, the, the decline in ejection fraction, I just I advised them to hold the combination temporarily. I started an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, and then we restarted Herceptin even though we hadn't reassessed the ejection fraction. So I said, asymptomatic person, EF 49%, hold the combination. I'm gonna start her on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. We're going to restart the Herceptin, and then we're going to check the ejection fraction. And if the ejection fraction remains greater than 40% and she remains asymptomatic, then I'm going to restart the combination therapy. The reason why I, I do this is because the data are extremely clear that if you hold HER2 therapy in the setting of breast cancer, the cancer outcomes decline dramatically. And that's why I'm really eager to make sure that we do everything possible, A, either not to hold therapy or B, get it restarted as quickly as possible. So. And a common approach I will actually do is even if the ejection fraction is in the 40s and the patient is fine, I will say to the, uh, to the oncologist, please continue therapy. I will watch this patient. Um, now, it's troublesome if the ejection fraction drops below uh, into the 30s or if the patient develops symptoms, then you clearly have to stop the cancer therapy. But in the absence of those, which is the most common um, uh, group, EF remains greater than 40%, the patient is fine, it's just the measure is a little bit low, I say continue cancer therapy. And there's some data to support this. Uh, nice work from Dr. Anna Barak, uh, the, uh, where, she, uh, where she looked, a study called Safe Heart, said that it's actually okay to adopt this approach in patients with an asymptomatic decline in ejection fraction, where it remains above 40%, it's okay to continue cancer therapy. So lastly, I'm gonna talk about immune therapies and cancer because I think this is the future. It is clear that it's a paradigm shift in the care of cancer patients. And this slide is not meant to be readable, but it's just to show that it's all about, it's all about immune therapies. In these studies, which are too numerous to read, there are multiple different either immune therapies alone or immune therapies in combination with traditional approaches such as anthracyclines, radiation therapy, targeted therapy. And in breast cancer highlighted in the bottom left, there are already published data. Recently in New England Journal, um, in triple negative breast cancer, they showed that the use of a checkpoint inhibitor, 
uh, the, was associated with improved outcomes. In clinical trials at the moment, and this image on the left here is to show the comparison, this large bubble here is the number of clinical trials, active clinical trials uh, using immunotherapy, and all these other bubbles are non-immunotherapy-based approaches. And you can see that the immunotherapy-based approaches is the largest bubble. So in 2017, there were over 1,000 agents being tested in over 3,000 clinical trials, and there, of which, and the number of FDA approvals has, has dramatically increased. And it's all about immune therapy. I mean, the checkpoint inhibitors just target one pathway in, the, in leveraging the immune system, here shown in the top left. Uh, but there's multiple different combinations using cytokines, using vaccines, using cell-based therapies like CAR-T, um, when the FDA, FDA approved these checkpoint inhibitors, they realized that there would be adverse events. You can't leverage the immune system without some occurrence of immune-related related adverse events. This is a consult. Now, full disclosure, this was a, a male patient with urothelial cancer, relatively unremarkable past medical history, and uh, started nivolumab, one of the checkpoint inhibitors, and went out with some friends one night, following day had a bit of diaphoresis, nausea and fatigue. He was brought to the emergency room because of the diaphoresis, nausea and fatigue and because of the starting of the new cancer therapy. No chest pain or shortness of breath. Had high sensitivity troponins, which were detectable, but flat and not that impressive. Anti-pro BMP was normal, but had this EKG where their right precordial ST T, uh, T wave changes and unfortunately didn't have a prior EKG. So no symptoms, detectable but relatively unremarkable sets of troponins and the CKG, which is abnormal but no prior. Uh, the emergency room did a stress test. Uh, the, the patient went, uh, had an excellent exercise capacity. EKG was negative. The myocardial images uh, were normal, no ischemia, and the ejection fraction was 72%. So, Two days later, this patient attended their regular oncology appointment and they repeated the EKG. And this is the EKG from their regular oncology appointment two days later where there's persistence of these STT wave changes. And just for comparison, I'm showing the prior EKG here on the right. So this is the emergency room EKG on the right and this is the EKG that the office did. And you can see they're pretty similar, both still abnormal. And the office called and said, you know, Tom, what we have this patient, this is the story, what do you think? And I didn't really know what to think. Uh, the, uh, so I said, another test. Uh, the, um, you can ask the logic of another test because this patient had a nuclear stress test with a preserved ejection fraction. But anyway, I asked him to do an echocardiogram and the echocardiogram said that the ejection fraction was normal, LV size was normal, the ejection fraction was 58%, no pericardial effusion. So they called back again and said, well, we've done the echocardiogram like you requested, uh, what next? Um, can we continue to give this patient immunotherapy? And I didn't really know the answer, so I defaulted like we all do and asked them for another test. And we did a cardiac MRI. And the cardiac MRI, uh, shown left here, the LGE, LGE images for um, fibrosis, which were normal, or sorry, shown on the left are the black blood images for T2, which were normal, and on the right here are the LGE, image, LGE images for fibrosis, which are also normal. And the MRI, the final report on the bottom here, they said no edema, no fibrosis, and no evidence of myocarditis. So what to do next? They said, we've done your two tests. We've done an echo and we've done an MRI. Um, what's the next step, Tom? Well, you could do this. You could say, reassure and continue cancer treatment, which is not unre unrealistic uh, or not, not terrible advice because the patient is fine, no heart failure therapy or arrhythmias. Troponin is relatively unremarkable, no MRI features of myocarditis. Patient had occasional significant alcohol intake and we had no prior EKGs or cardiac studies. Or do you tell them, I actually, I actually don't know, and you recommend a biopsy. So in this case, I recommend a biopsy and the pathologist was unfortunately very excited and said, there's lymphocytic myocarditis. Uh, they gave me a grade similar to they give grades for transplant rejection. And they said, this is grade 3B, which is relatively remarkable to us in that the patient was fine, uh, but had this degree of uh, histological abnormalities on their biopsy. Uh, 
So this patient was treated with a gram of methylprednisone, 1,000 milligrams per day, and then a transition to oral prednisone and uh, the um, and you can see there was normalization of the EKG. Now, some of the cases that I see in relation to checkpoint inhibitors aren't as subtle as this. So this is a patient who presented with a chest pain and shortness of breath, had a markedly abnormal uh, ejection fraction on cardiac MRI, um, developed cardiogenic shock with decreasing blood pressure and congestion, and on biopsy, on the left here is normal, and on the right here is their cardiac biopsy. And you can see there's this marked uh, infiltrate here. And again, the pathologist scored at first and said, this is grade three transplant and uh, rejection, probably another grade three B. Uh, this patient actually continued to decline despite steroids. And, uh, the, um, and we treated this patient with ATG or anti-thymocyclobulin. And they had a follow-up echocardiogram about 20, or 20 days later or so showing uh, normalization of the ejection fraction. So, a checkpoint inhibitor associated with myocarditis, it's clearly fulminant, a case fatality rate of about 30 to 50 percent versus at most 2 percent uh, of myocarditis cases which are not related to checkpoint inhibitors. And additionally, there's significant morbidity, so cardiogenic shock, cardiac arrest, VT, or complete heart block. Critically and importantly, 38 percent of these events occurred in patients despite a normal ejection fraction. So unlike the traditional paradigm where you see a patient with myocarditis in the setting of a, a viral illness, maybe not COVID, but uh, a viral illness, where you say, well, your ejection fraction is normal, you know, you need to rest, refrain from competitive exercise, but you should, you'll be fine. That's not the case with myocarditis related to a checkpoint inhibitor. So why does it occur? Well, we're not entirely clear, but in animal models, if you block PD-1, and induce, my, induce a viral myocarditis, you see this marked increase in lymphocytic infiltration in the myocardium with increased troponin and the animals die quicker. So blocking PD-1 is associated with increased injury. When does checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis typically present? Well, the data are relatively consistent and the myocarditis usually presents early, so after, within the first couple of cycles. This was a report of, the, of uh, 35 cases where the median time of onset was between 34 and 60 days, with over 80% presenting within the first three months of starting therapy. So the paradigm that we accept is that myocarditis related to a checkpoint inhibitor traditionally presents early. How, if you look at the standard testing, troponin is typically abnormal. So over 90% of cases had an elevated troponin. Most have an abnormal anti-pro BMP. Importantly, though, the left ventricular ejection fraction is normal in well over half the cases. So the first case we saw had a normal ejection fraction. The second case we saw had a markedly impaired ejection fraction. But most of the cases I see now have a normal ejection fraction. The EKG is usually abnormal. This is the EKG from the first case that we, we, we discussed, where there's these STT wave changes. But there are other parameters in the EKG as well. Uh, the, um, you can measure the Q QRS and QTC interval and work being led by one of our fellows, Dr. Zlatov, where he measured the PR interval, the QRS interval, and the QTC in patients who developed myocarditis related to, in 130 patients or so who developed myocarditis related to checkpoint inhibitor. And you can see that there's an increase in QRS interval. The increase in QTC interval was seen when we corrected using Bezets, but not seen when we, when we correct using Fiderencia. Uh, likely a reflection of the limitation somewhat of uh, Bizet's formula, but we relatively consistently find an increase in the QRS interval among patients who develop myocarditis related to a checkpoint inhibitor. And the QRS interval both increases and is higher than patients who get checkpoint inhibitors and who don't develop myocarditis. And the increase in QRS width also has prognostic significance, so the wider the QRS to unfortunately, more likely you are to develop a major adverse cardiac event. How about the echo in ICI myocarditis? Well, if you're just looking at ejection fraction, you're going to miss more than half of the cases. So more than half of the cases have a normal ejection fraction. And recent data suggests it's about 60% have a normal ejection fraction. But there are other indices in echo you can look at. And global longitudinal strain is a relatively established metric. And 
in patients who develop uh, uh, myocarditis related to a checkpoint inhibitor, you see a reduction in global longitudinal strain with ICI myocarditis. Also, importantly, the reduction in global longitudinal strain is seen in both cases presenting with a preserved, with a, with a preserved ejection fraction and a reduced ejection fraction. This is important because over half the cases have, have a preserved ejection fraction. So it, it suggests that in folks in whom there's a suspicion of ICI myocarditis, that if you also measure GLS, that it's helpful in these patients. And those with a redu reduced GLS, that's evidence to support the fact that they may have myocarditis going on. The reduction in GLS has prognostic significance, both in the reduced ejection fraction group and in the preserved ejection fraction group. Uh, the preserved ejection, ejection fraction group was relatively impressive in that if your global longitudinal strain um, remains preserved in the setting of myocarditis, you generally do very well. How about cardiac MRI? Uh, work from Dr. Lily Zhang published recently in the European Heart Journal where she looked at 124 patients, uh, the, um, of whom almost 90 had a cardiac MRI. She looked at two metrics which are established in the assessment of myocarditis using MRI, lake adenine enhancement and edema using black blood imaging. In patients who had a preserved ejection fraction, almost half of them had neither, despite, having, despite being diagnosed with myocarditis, mostly by biopsy. So the, present, the lack of lake, the message here would be the lack of lake adenine enhancement and the lack of edema on black blood imaging on a cardiac MRI is not enough to exclude the diagnosis. You can see these pretty pictures, right? So when you do look at these lake adenine enhancements, you can see these images where you see either transmural. So transmural, we typically associate with myocardial infarction, but the patients who had transmural also had pathological evidence of myocarditis. Uh, the, um, but you can see mid-myocardial, you can see epicardial, you can see this diffuse pattern on the bottom left here, or you can see this patchy pattern where there's like different types of LG. But you can also see normal LG in people who go on to have pathological evidence of myocarditis, either on endomyocardial biopsy or on pathology. So this is a suggested workup where we do an EKG troponin BMP. If they're unstable, they get uh, cardiac cath to exclude coronary disease and then the myocardial biopsy. If they're stable, they get a cardiac MRI. If their cardiac MRI has no LGE and the T2 is normal and you're still, your suspicion is high, then they still get in the myocardial biopsy. But if their cardiac MRI suggests myocarditis, then that confirms the diagnosis. I don't yet, I'm not yet able to present data on the application of more advanced MRI techniques um, such as T1 and T2 mapping, but um, but those data are forthcoming. This is suggested management in myocarditis. The, if the left ventricular ejection fraction is normal and no malignant rhythms, they get a gram of solumedrol. If the myocarditis persists, they get felsept or mycophenolate. If it persists after that, then it's dealer's choice. Uh, consider IVIG, cyclosporin, plasmapheresis, or abatacept, which is a ctl 4 agonist. If the ejection fraction is reduced or the patient's unstable, I always ask our heart failure colleagues to get involved. And a common reason for asking them to get involved is to, uh, if the patient declines and needs mechanical, some form of at least temporary mechanical support. I'm not talking about emergency heart transplantation or, or um, left ventricular assist device, uh, or permanent left ventricular assist device, but I'm talking about temporary left ventricular assist devices, such as impellas. Because these patients, if you get immunosuppression on board, they will turn around. And I usually start them on high-dose corticosteroids and either anti-thymocyclobulin or ATG or abatacept. More recently, I've been using abatacept for these relatively unstable, unstable patients, either shortly after starting high-dose corticosteroids or at the same time as starting high-dose corticosteroids. So are there any evidence for high-dose corticosteroids? Uh, uh, Dr. Lily Zhang has a paper which is in press in circulation where she shows that uh, high dose steroids actually do improve outcomes. And this was typically a gram of solumedrol a day as compared to intermediate or lower dose steroids. Also critically, she showed that time to steroids was important. Whereas if you give steroids early after the presentation, that patients tend to do an awful lot better than giving any dose of steroids very late. Uh, 
There are options for people who fail steroids. I mentioned them previously, but abatacept and alemtuzumab for, for patients who are not doing well on steroids. And more recently, we started to use abatacept for these breakthrough patients, uh, especially those who are unstable. In the final couple of slides, I'm going to talk about atherosclerosis, even though this is a relatively data-free zone. But it's clear in animal data that if you blockade PD-1, PDL one and CTLA-4, that you, um, if you blockade PD-1 and PDL one you increase inflammation and accelerate atherosclerosis. A CTLA-4 agonist leads to decreased inflammation and reduced atherosclerotic burden. But there are no data on whether these checkpoint inhibitors uh, can actually increase atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. But this is our hypothesis that if you give immune checkpoint inhibitors, you get this enhanced immune response. This um, enhanced immune response leads to accelerated atherosclerosis. And I think ultimately we're going to see a lot of increased atherosclerotic related cardiovascular events. So my sense is that the myocarditis is likely the tip of the iceberg and the more likely the main component of the iceberg in patients who survive will be an increase or it will be accelerated atherosclerosis leading to increased cardiovascular events. I think this theory is a little bit less relevant to patients who are late stage cancers and whom the expected survival is less than a year. But it's highly, it's likely to be a lot more relevant for the patients who get who qualify for adjuvant and neoadjuvant checkpoint inhibitors who are likely to live a lot longer. I only have an anecdote, but this is a patient of mine who had a CAT scan of his heart uh, the, um, in January 2019 in the uh, CT of his heart. And you can see that he's got lumps and bumps, but no major obstructive coronary disease. And he, come, and he came into our emergency room uh, not too long after, March 2019, with chest pain and EKG changes, and you can see that he's got critical coronary disease here and here. And this has developed over a relatively short time. Uh, the, um, he was started on a checkpoint inhibitor in January, and his presentation was in March 2019. Sure, it might be completely unrelated, but there's significant basic science plausibility to suggest that it may actually be related. But evolving data will help determine whether that's true or not. So this is my last slide, and just to summarize, the exercise tolerance of a VO2, uh, VO2 max of a 45-year-old woman treated for breast cancer is the same as that of a sedentary 75-year-old female. The rates of incident heart failure are eight times higher than matched controls after conventional photon radiation therapy for breast cancer. So it'll be important to test whether proton radiation therapy might be protective um, in this, in, in this at-risk cohort. It is more common to, for a woman to die of heart, with early stage breast cancer, to die of heart disease than it is to die of cancer. And finally, some of the novel cancer therapies, which may be associated with uncommon, but, uh, but, particularly, but potentially malignant cardiac side effects. I'm speaking particularly of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. I think in the early stages, there's an uncommon side effect called my, uh, with myocarditis, but in the late stages, I worry that we may see accelerated atherosclerosis leading to atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular events. I'd very much like to thank the organizers for the invitation, and I'd like to thank you for your time.